Welcome. My name is Aaron Glass. I'm a faculty member here at the Bard Graduate Center, um, and I'd like to welcome you all um, tonight to uh, all of you in this room and um, to our remote viewers as well from wherever you may be streaming um, to this first seminar of the year in our series, Indigenous Arts in Translation. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Castle McLaughlin, who comes to us from her post as curator of North American ethnography at Harvard's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology, where she's worked since 1999. Trained in anthropology at Indiana and Columbia universities, she's a specialist in Plains Indian visual and material culture, the subject of numerous articles, exhibitions, and monographs focused on topics ranging from the politics of agrarian transformation to the, his to the history of wild horses. Uh, and I guess ranging is the right word in that context. <laughs> McLaughlin has been the recipient of several distinguished awards, including a President's Fellowship at Columbia University, a Woodrow Wilson Rural Policy Fellowship, an NEH planning grant to redesign the Peabody's Museum, uh, the Hall of the North American Indian. Over the past decade, she has contributed to the curation of important exhibits at the Peabody, including A View from the River, The Legacy of Penobscot Canoes, which opened in April of this year, uh, Wiyok Pieta, Lakota Images of a Contested West in 2009, and From Nation to Nation, examining Lewis and Clark's Indian collection in 2003, which resulted in her first book, which I have here, The Arts of Diplomacy, uh, of the same year, which I might add is currently on reserve for two classes here at the BGC this semester. McLaughlin's most recent book, published just last year, is entitled A War Book from Little Bighorn, the pictographic autobiography of Half Moon. It examines a previously overlooked ledger book filled with drawings by Plains Indians that was found near the famous Little Bighorn battlefield. A review by Thomas Powers in the April 2014 issue of the New York Review of Books had this to say about it. What's interesting about McLaughlin's book, in the way that only an exhaustive inquiry can truly be interesting, is the quantity of fundamental information she manages to wring from these drawings, when they were made, who made them, and what they depicted. Her arguments must be taken seriously. They unfold at length, weighted with 100 plus pages of detail that are sweeter than honey to anyone fascinated by the effort to rescue these artists from anonymous oblivion." Unquote. Her talk tonight, which draws on this material, is provocatively entitled, Dog Soldiers Don't Need Picasso, Recovering the Indigenous Materiality of Plains Indian Ledger Art. Please join me in welcoming Castle McLaughlin. Thank you very much, Aaron. You certainly did your research. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's really nice to be back in New York. I got my PhD here um, 20 years ago, the same year this institution opened. This is my first visit, although I hear about it all the time. Um, there's quite a buzz, and so I'm delighted to have an opportunity to learn about it. And um, just want to thank everyone that's been involved with organizing my visit. And also um, it express my thanks to some special guests in the audience. Um, I have many family and friends here tonight and um, especially want to thank my graduate school advisor from Columbia, Dr. Paula Rubel and her husband, A. Brossman, for coming. So let's get going with some visuals. There's, there's supposed to be an image before the first one I'm getting. Are the IT people still on hand? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all right. I mean, we can just... Um, all right, so let's just um, forge ahead. Um, Many of you may be aware that right now one of the most important trends in the museum world is the way that art museums 
um, across the country, major art museums as well as regional and, and small art museums of every scale are reinventing themselves um, to broaden their purview away from the traditional emphasis on Western art and to include indigenous works from around the world um, and embrace a more global um, vision um, of art and what it can mean. Um, so as Aaron mentioned, I'm a Plains Indian specialist. This is an image I took a couple of weeks ago in Kansas City at the opening of a major international exhibition on the Plains Indians um, as artists. Um, and I was there for the opening. This is a kind of extraordinary exhibit. Uh, it was conceived in Paris at the Quai Branly Museum. The director invited Gaylord Torrance, the curator at the Nelson Atkins, who's with us tonight, um, to guest curate this sort of once in a lifetime enormous um, bringing together of uh, Gaylord's choice of the best things from collections all around the world, and it opened in Paris, is now opened in Kansas City, and will be coming to the Met next spring. And uh, it's been described as a defining moment in the history of Plains Indian art to come to this kind of venue and level. So the Nelson is sort of uh, on the leading edge of this trend, which is practiced differently um, at different places. But uh, there are a few things that the curators and institutions and art historians um, have in common that advocate this. It's, it's a much heralded uh, paradigm to represent native materials as art. Um, it's seen as the way forward in this day and age, you know, um, post-colonial, post-modern global world that we live in. It's often described also as a corrective to museum anthropology in the way <coughs> anthropologists have historically presented Native American material. And the critique has always been that in anthropology museums, the material is uh, ordinary. You know, it may reflect uh, the functional values rather than aesthetic. Um, and the aesthetic is a low priority. Um, also, there's been a lot of criticism of the idea of cultural attributions or considering things as made by cultures rather than individuals. So this is a corrective that's come along in the last uh, few decades and is gathering steam. Now, please notice uh, the labels here. Um, advocates of this approach share a few, let's say, convictions or beliefs. Uh, one is that Everyone in the world can appreciate objects uh, for their aesthetic value or formal impact, um, regardless of the origins or history um, of those objects. Um, also, that there, it no longer is um, acceptable to make a differentiation between historic objects that may have been created 200 years ago versus contemporary forms made by living artists, um, whether they're North American Indians or indigenous Australian people. Um, again, the emphasis that these things are made by individuals, not by cultures. And so you see on the label, and this has become very common in the last 20 years, to attribute things to an Arapaho artist a Cheyenne artist, and so forth. Now, ideally, um, many curators would like to identify those artists. So the recovery of formerly unrecognized uh, artists has become a mission in many museums or for many curators, uh, trying to 
discover who these individuals were, what their names were, so that those can be added to the label and you know to the canon and to history. And lastly, I would say there's kind of uh, a lot of idealism um, involved in this because you often hear people talk about the what they're doing in terms of elevating indigenous, in this case, Native American arts, to a uh, regime of value that's more high status than they have been accorded in anthropology museums, and to make them sort of equivalent in terms of value to Western art, to uh, the idea is that this is good for both the Native American artists because it elevates these cultures and also teaches people to appreciate the, the viewer, the public that goes to museums, um, learn to broaden their own purview. And I don't disagree with much of this. I think that um, it's a perfectly valid thing to consider these uh, Native American objects, whether they're historic or contemporary, as art. Um, I don't disagree with some of the critiques of anthropology. Um, even the term material culture is a little bit ethnocentric. That is to say, I think that museum anthropologists are sort of the last to try and take an emic, uh, try and understand native perspectives on objects. So rather than you know using the objects to construct typologies or whatever. Um, and oh, it's only been in recent years that anthropologists have begun to develop uh, theories of materialism in terms of objects as material objects and to recognize that different peoples around the world have different ontologies that generate different ideas about objects and about different kinds of objects within those cultures. And museum anthropologists have really not taken this into account. And one of the things I like about the art uh, emphasis is that it forces a close observation of the, of the things themselves. And that's something that anthropology has traditionally not done too much of. We've talked about objects in a variety of ways, but it's generally rather abstract and doesn't really reference you know, the thing. And there is certainly power in form that, that people do respond to. So, um, but you know, based on my title, you might be anticipating that I do, in fact, have some reservations about this. And um, that is based on the research that I finished last year uh, that Aaron mentioned on a particular collection of Plains Indian drawings that was discovered at Harvard. So now I'm gonna talk about that a little bit and then we can get back to the uh, larger topic at the end. So for some reason, since I've been at Harvard, uh, things I've been fortunate enough to work on some really remarkable things and including some things that seem to just kind of emerge out of obscurity. So in 2005, I believe it was, Houghton Library, which is the rare book library on campus, uh, realized that they had a document and were looking at the binding and the frontispiece uh, that they thought was a, had been cataloged in 1930 when it was donated as a published book but uh, when someone actually took it off the shelf and looked at it, they realized that it was filled with these original drawings by Plains Indian uh, men. And so the frontispiece here is part of a, an introduction that the collector, a man named Foshan Howard, commissioned for this collection of drawings uh, and uh, it's actually illustrated. There are many dimensions of this document, which is very remarkable and rich that I, I can't, don't have time to really address. Um, but there's a whole chapter in my book about um, sort of how this book records cross-cultural perceptions, how late 19th century Americans thought about Plains Indians and vice versa. So 
Foshan Howard, this collector, was a news reporter who worked for the Chicago Tribune, and he was sent uh, to Montana. Actually, a lot of reporters were embedded with military troops during the Indian Wars, and after the Custer battle, he was sent uh, to Montana to join the Army's campaign to try and find the Cheyenne and Lakota people that had defeated Custer. And according to this introduction that uh, he appended to the drawings and then bound in this ornate leather casing, um, he was given the, the book of drawings there in Montana uh, by an army private. But what he did is he took it back to Chicago and he totally transformed it into this mythical story of Half Moon, um, a, a chief, and he, he reordered the pages so that the drawings are like a coming of age story of, of this Half Moon, who is entirely fictional. Um, but we can see on this single sheet that according to Howard, the document itself was found in a, he goes into more detail later, but the gist of it is that, that it was found in a funerary lodge two days after the Custer fight by the army um, that came, that Custer was supposed to wait for and rescued the survivors and buried the, the dead there were a number of funerary lodges on the battlefield, and when they opened one, um, there were a number of dead warriors inside, and one of them uh, was accompanied by this document. Because of that, uh, it's immediately apparent that this was going to be considered an associated funerary object under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, um, and so, as after I had gone to the library and looked at the book and the drawings, I went back to the office and notified the people at Standing Rock, the reservation where the this Hunk Papa Lakota people live, and um, entered. We eventually entered into an agreement of understanding with Standing Rock, the library, and the Peabody, collaborating for the next couple of years to try and research this document and verify whether the history that the collector tells was true. Is this really from the Little Big Horn? Um, are, were the men that drew in it really Lakota? Um, was it associated with the burial and so forth? So let's look inside a little bit. The very first page, um, after you get past the illustrated introduction, which we're not gonna discuss, but there are 77 drawings in this, in this ledger. Let's see. She said this was stronger though. Okay, so there's 77 drawings in colored pencil and pen and ink. Um, basically, the document was originally owned by a Euro-American man named J.S. Moore, whose signature is up here at the top. Now, according to Foshan Howard, the collector, um, J.S. Moore, he tells the whole story in the introduction, and left Nebraska City with some other men in 1866. They were heading to the Montana gold field in uh, Virginia City, Montana, up in the mountains. They stayed for about a year and a half, and in 1868, on the way back, they were jumped by a group of warriors who killed uh, J.S. Moore and took his account book and repurposed it for their own drawings. And according to Howard, this particular drawing from um, the book depicts the death of J.S. Moore. However, there's no way to know. Um, the only real evidence in terms of historical documentation to go by uh, comes from Howard and what he says in the introduction. 
So this is one of uh, only a few palimpsest pages that are left in the document. Um, apparently, Howard removed everything that had writing on it unless there was a native drawing that was on top of it. And so a lot of what he refers to in the introduction, there's no remaining evidence actually in the book for. But I was able to find some um, evidence uh, from other sources that sort of substantiate Howard's story. And uh, in particular, I just want to read a quick quote written by a man named William White, who was a private um, and was present in the aftermath of the Little Bighorn. He his memoirs were published in like 1940, decades after Foshan Howard had died. Um, and in them I found a description um, about a ledger, and this is what William White said. I found a gunny sack having in it many letters. They had been mailed as shown by the stampings. Evidently, some stage driver or uh, post office had been robbed. In the sack was some other paper material, including an account book. On its first page was a list of about 20 names. Subsequent pages had accounts charged against individual names. On some pages were drawings made by the Indian possessor. I gave the sack and its contents to a Chicago newspaper man traveling with us. So long story short, um, we did uh, conclude that Howard's story was essentially um, plausible. And um, one of the things that, in addition to the specific evidence like that, it makes his story make sense from the perspective of what was going on in the West during those years that J.S. Moore was uh, reputed to be traveling back and forth. So this is a map of the Great Overland Trails. The background to this whole story, of course, is national expansion to the West, which began in the 1840s and built up steam in the 50s and really uh, by the 1860s, there were many thousands of people every week traveling across these lands, uh, Nebraska, Kansas, Wyoming, um, going to Denver, going to Oregon, going to California. Uh, well, unfortunately, you know, those were the hunting grounds of the most um, militaristic of the pl and dominant of the Plains groups, including the Lakota, the Western Sioux, uh, the Cheyenne, um, the Arapaho, and south a little bit, Kiowa and Comanche. And the impact uh, was devastating because suddenly you had, you know, these hundreds if not thousands of wagons every day um, stopping at the same water holes, you know, livestock grazing, um, uh, denuding the grass, they're bringing diseases, they often uh, are antagonistic towards uh, native people. They begin to displace them. Lots of conflicts begin to develop. And so one of the major uh, conflicts that resulted happened in between 1866 and 1868 on the Bozeman Trail. And uh, that that uh, conflict is often referred to as Red Cloud's War. This is a photograph of Red Cloud, the Oglala Lakota war leader, uh, who galvanized um, the resistance to the United States military building a series of, of forts to protect people that were traveling that Bozeman Trail, as, was JS, as did J.S. Moore and his friends, up into the Montana mountains. Uh, when the government began building those forts, Red Cloud and his Confederates um, immediately declared war and threatened to kill or destroy everyone who set foot um, on that uh, path, that road, the Bozeman Trail, the wagon road up to the mountains. And they 
pretty much lived up to their word um, to the extent that within two years, the government was forced to back down and actually shutter those forts and retreat because uh, there was so much violence. Um, now, the other thing I want to mention about Red Cloud and his defense is that he represents a really important transformation in uh, the social organization on the plains that uh, was a result of this new political economy of westward expansion. So up until the 1850s, 1860s, trade was the predominant uh, enterprise that uh, drew together Indian and non-Indian people. However, there was not a lot of direct contact, and there were very few uh, Euro-Americans living on the plains. They pretty much passed through, or there were traders who gathered robes that uh, plains Indian people would hunt, and then passed them up the chain of distribution. But there was really no immediate threat uh, to the indigenous peoples, and to some extent, they were benefiting from this. Now, at that time, they, um, their leadership was in the hands of traditional chiefs who tended to be older men, who tended to be fairly temperate, and who wanted to preserve the status quo. And it was these traditional leaders who had responsibility to um, conduct diplomatic relationships with outsiders. When national expansion started, you know, it's a whole different ball game, and now there are people settling, uh, you know, all over, and its attentions, you know, build fairly quickly. And what happens is that you see a rise of a new kind of leadership. So a number of Plains tribes suffer what's been called a crisis of authority at this time. The young men, you know, these are war-oriented societies, and that is a way to status and a way of life. And they were very difficult to curb, and it, and it kind of got to the point where they stopped, as uh, some of them said, uh, looking up to chiefs. And so you see the rise of a new kind of leader, and it's a war war leader, and Red Cloud is one of those. Um, and that's an important part of this story that we'll pick up in a minute. This is just a better map um, showing the, um, although it doesn't show up terribly well, the hypothetical route that this J.S. Moore took from Nebraska City over on the right um, up the Bozeman Trail and highlights some of the battles with the military. Um, a lot of the traffic on these trails was military or commercial contractors. You know, the military did things like build bridges, build roads. They needed lots of logs and uh, nails and hammers. And so there's a lot of commercial traffic as well as civilians as well as actual military people. And you see the forts there above Fort, Laramore, above Fort Laramie, Fetterman, Reno, and Phil Kearney, which are the ones that were contested between 66 and 68. And so we'll come back to this. So the first thing that in, in engaging with this document, this book of drawings, the tribe Standing Rock um, and the university, meaning really the library and the museum, decided pretty early on that no matter what happened, it was my responsibility to you know, conduct research to, as I mentioned a minute ago, to try and verify Howard's story, try and figure out who this person might have been in the funerary lodge that had this book with them. Um, and so we didn't know uh, what the future was of the document, but we all agreed that what we would do first is do an exhibit. And um, so we wanted to have a Lakota co-curator, and I asked a friend of mine, Butch Thunderhawk, seen in this picture, to help with that because he is hunk papa. And Butch um, teaches traditional tribal arts in Bismarck, North Dakota, 
Um, and he's raised in a traditional fashion, but a really good person to work with um, and a very gifted artist himself. And so Butch and I spent three years just looking at these drawings over and over, traveling around South and North Dakota, talking to people on the reservation and off about the images um, and trying to come up with a plan for how we were going to represent them. And this is a, a glimpse at the completed gallery. Um, Aaron mentioned this in the introduction. It opened in 2009, and it's called Wilk Piata, Lakota Images of the Contested West. And you can see that what we did is we used the images from this book, but we, those were just one element in a, in a kind of complex composition. We used historic objects, we used contemporary art, we wanted to create a multi-sensory environment, so we used sound, we used video. And the reason that we did that is because when Butch and I were working with this document, we felt strongly that our greatest responsibility was to the men who made these drawings. And we wanted to show it in a, in a way that might represent some of their reality, what they would find important. So we were trying to do a Lakota-centric exhibit, which is a very difficult thing to do. Lots of talks about what is Lakota culture, how do you access the most foundational principles, how are those manifest, how, will the, how can those be represented visually, and so on. Um, but it's, it's actually worked, but that's a whole, a whole other talk. Um, so Butch, let me go. Butch was interested in particular in um, the spiritually, spirituality of warfare. So I asked him as co-curator, what do you most want to convey to people when they come in this ga gallery? And he said, the spiritual basis for warfare. What he meant was the belief system that under lies or underlay the actual practice of warfare. Uh, in other words, he didn't want people to feel that he wasn't at all that interested in the political economy, which I am, which, you know, of westward expansion, sort of the bigger historical scheme, but he was very um, fascinated by and felt a great affinity for the sort of religious or cosmological foundations for Lakota warfare. And the name of the exhibit, Wiok Piata, is like a triple entendre, but it means the West in Lakota. But for Lakota people, the West is not just a direction, it's a constellation of forces that reside there, and the ones uh, they reside in each direction, the forces in the West um, govern both storms and warfare, which are metaphorically linked in Lakota culture. There's a, a larger thing, too, the sky powers, um, are viewed as the source of animacy and agency among Lakota people or in Lakota thought. This is a picture of a supercell. I believe it was taken in Kansas. I'm sure everyone here knows on the plains tornadoes um, are fairly common and they are among the most powerful natural forces humans have ever experienced. And this is the kind of thing that Lakotas had in mind when they're thinking of storms. Uh, for them, these storms uh, were just incredibly, had an incredible amount of energy and instrumental power. And what they wanted to do was communicate with that, access it, and find a way to tap into it to help them um, in warfare. So the colors blue and black are very important uh, in the ideas about Wilk Piata, and there are certain categories or were certain categories 
of warriors that were actual thunder dreamers, and they had to behave in prescribed way. Um, they were able to channel this and control this, this energy, including lightning, hail, and some really violent uh, weather. So, um, so how did they do that? How did they uh, connect to that and manage it in part through the inscription? Um, so here, the iconography on the shield, which references uh, celestial and sky powers. Um, these sorts of things are, were considered to be more powerful than, you know, guns, sabers, and things like that. Another important um, way that warriors would uh, access and activate these kinds of energies are through, uh, or the making of, it's kind of hard to express, but what we see in this picture is, this is a drawing from the Houghton Ledger, and this man is um, on a war expedition. He's taking horses, and you can tell from the halter and the shoes on the horse on the right that this is, uh, they're American horses, not Indian horses, and he's driving one ahead of him, the important thing here is the bird in his bonnet. It's, um, it's a, probably a heron or a crane, and it's sounding, right? It's coming to life. And this is a Wotawe. It's a war medicine. And the old-time warriors uh, used, used to describe um, battles as gaining in intensity, and when they got to a certain point, point, their Wotawe would spring to life spontaneously um, and help them. So uh, that is a kind of object used in war that uh, will come into play as we go forward. All right, so there's a lot of things about the ledger. Um, for one thing, now, after a few years of looking at these drawings and doing this beautiful installation, Butch had absolutely no interest in trying to figure out, you know, who these people might be um, because it requires hours and hours of comparative looking at other ledgers and reading historic sources, reading early ethnographic sources. Um, this particular drawing, though, I want to use to point out that a little bit about the nature of these drawings. So men drew these. They are, they are actual records of their experiences in battle, but you can see that this is a very um, close uh, perspective. So they don't include background. They don't include a lot of information about the broader battle. It's sort of how they confronted their enemy and, and what happened. So these drawings are narrative in nature. Um, there's some variation between artists and the way they handle things. Um, it's not exactly like a written language, but they're very careful to show the details that help identify the event and the people. So this helped a lot. Um, so for Obviously, this man is fighting a soldier. It's an officer. He's trying to take this officer's horse and saddle his fine equipment, which they often tried to do. Horses were one of the main uh, things they wanted out of battle with people to take the horses. Um, and in the lower right-hand corner, you can see that little half man figure, that is a narrative device that's used to show past tense. So that person has already been killed. Um, now he's engaging with this person. Um, I was able, and we, I'm not going to go into much about the little bighorn or um, the content of the drawings because I don't have time, but uh, details like uniform garments, the style of the saddles, um, 
the horse equipment, uh, shield designs, the way different warriors painted their horses, um, and so forth, can be very helpful to in figuring out, you know, when these events took place and who was involved. And just to kind of cut to the um, conclusion of that kind of analysis, I do think, or I did think when I finished looking at all these drawings, that Foshan Howard again was right. I think that many of the drawings in this book are an Indian record or visual history of events that took place during Red Cloud's War on the Bozeman Trail, and they are remarkable in that regard. I think this particular drawing illustrates an incident that happened in the winter of 1866, just a few weeks before the big fight um, at Fort Phil Kearney, uh, known as the Fetterman fight, when a group of Lakota and Cheyenne warriors um, drew the soldiers from the fort into a fight and, and killed all of them, 80 men. And um, that was a big victory for them and a great discouragement for the government. So one of the things I did, which unfortunately I don't have time to talk about, is I tried to unpack each drawing and then looking at the relationships between the drawings, seeing if I could fit them to historic events. And I was able to uh, ultimately, although it took years, um, and again, just to underscore that I do think most of them are uh, depict events from the 1860s when warfare with American soldiers and civilians was at its height. Um, so here's another example of that. This is a warrior, a man who drew, I believe, 22 or 23 of the drawings in the book. He always rides this blue roan horse. Um, in this drawing, he's shown um, lancing a scout a Native American who's working for the army. <clears throat> I believe the man that uh, is shown on this horse was a very well-known Minikoju Lakota uh, war leader named Hump or High Backbone, who was the uncle of Crazy Horse. I believe this incident happened in 1865, uh, not too far from the Bozeman Trail. But another thing I want to draw your attention to is the, um, oops, his lance has a pipe tied to it. Oops. And that, now Cheyenne people did often tie things to their lances. Hump himself was half Cheyenne, half Lakota. This could represent a real pipe, or it could be an ideogram representing uh, the leadership of a major war party. And the man High Backbone, the real historical figure, did lead that campaign against the uh, Fort Phil Kearney in 1866. Another example of content in a drawing that helps establish the identity of the people depicted. In this case, it's another lance, but this lance is a war society lance. So men belong to fraternal war societies. And all those societies had their specific regalia that they gave to their members when they're inducted into them. And those regalia, uh, were also considered almost animate. They were considered to be empowering. They were considered uh, things that would help you in battle. This particular lance um, is the style used by a society called Wikishka, and that was a Southern Lakota war society that was prominent during the same time period, 1860s, and it was founded by a, a very well-known uh, man. Um, man. His name's erroneously uh, translated, man, af uh, man afraid of his horses, or they're even afraid of his horses, 
the elder, he also had a son with a similar name. So the members of this group were down there around Nebraska, Kansas. They were the southern bands of Lakota, Oglala Lakotas, like Red Cloud. And the other thing just to note is uh, the fact that this warrior is wearing military garments, um, probably captured, um, maybe a shell jacket, um, maybe repurposed army pants, the silver hair plates cascading down his back. Uh, it's a style that um, was popularized by Cheyenne people who went down into, into Mexico and fought dragoons there and traded um, <laughs> and were great intermediaries on the plains and were closely allied with Lakotas. So now we're just a quick thing about ledger art. Um, most ledger studies have been based on a set of drawings that were done by a group of war prisoners, mainly Cheyenne and Kiowa men um, who were imprisoned in Florida between 1875 and 77. And uh, while they were imprisoned, they were um, subjected to a program, uh, sort of experiential adult learning, let's say. Um, uh, the man, Captain Pratt, that was in charge of them, was one of those famous men from the 19th century that said, you know, kill the Indian, save the man. And so he wanted to see whether these adult warriors could be taught, you know, sort of acculturated. Could they learn to read and write um, and so forth. And while they were there, in addition to um, the courses that they took in that, they did a lot of famous drawings or they did a, lot, did a lot of drawings that later became famous. This is one of them. Um, this is another. Now, these were discovered in the early part of the 20th century or rediscovered, and by 1970, there were a group of art historians, anthropologists, historians that were looking at these drawings a lot, and they've had a lot to do with influencing um, the definition of ledger art and the way that ledger art has been viewed um, by scholars, although they're really not typical of, of ledger art. And one of the things that I think happened there at Fort Marion, so this, one of the big points of my book is that although scholars have looked at these drawings monolithically, irregardless of when they're drawn, so everything in the 19th century and early 20th century. And they've used the same methodologies and ideas about all of them. But they're actually very different, uh, they're phases of these drawings and they're very different in nature. So this is a picture of another uh, Indian Wars period ledger. Um, it was typical that when tribal people got these books and drew in them, they would often start in the back and move towards the front. Um, they would turn the spine uh, of the book, um, and often uh, Cheyenne especially did these sort of symmetrical um, mirror image compositions on, on the pages. But the way they handled the paper changed at Fort Marion, and I think it had to do with literacy. You know, literacy has a lot to do with historical consciousness and our concepts of time and everything. Well, the Plains people did not have any inclination to go left to right, front to back. Um, but they began to at Fort Marion. So there's a kind of chronology here where you go from the book we just saw to sh single sheets of paper. Um, the drawings changed, sort of generic. Um, scenes of life on the plains, there men do begin to obviously experiment with line and color, um, men that had an affinity for that. 
And so as you move into the early reservation period, not at Fort Marion, but el elsewhere, over time these drawings become more representational and sort of more like Western drawing. And this is a sketch page uh, for a Kiowa artist, Silverhorn. You do have men starting to consider themselves artists and, um, you know, there's some just amazing drawings that some of these men did. And ledger art still done today. This is a contemporary take by Dwayne Wilcox. Um, so one of the things is at Fort Marion and during the reservation era, we have the emergence of the named artist. And that is one reason that art historians have found this to be uh, such a treasure trove. But even anthropologists have tended to focus on the image, on the drawing, as the important thing here. And part of it is because of that long chronology. So the pictographic drawing style is ancient. This is a, a teepee liner that was collected in the 1850s that's in the Wilk Piat exhibit. Men were drawing their war stories on robes, hide robes, before the advent of paper. Also garments. They engraved things on silver. We can think of rock art with the same kind of pictographs. And because of that, there was just this acceptance that what we're looking at is this visual vocabulary um, over time that it may change media and the media changes are sort of a temporal, uh, a handy heuristic device, but it's essentially the same thing and the drawings are the most important things. So um, even though a lot of people have been fascinated by the sort of hybridity of the ledger drawings, that is how the Plains artists used Western uh, media um, and combined that with their more into, you know, to create these more traditional scenes, that has been viewed as rather incidental. And just a short quote from an art historian uh, from a, 1994, she may have changed her mind, but I don't think so. Um, she became a little frustrated with people referring to all this, uh, using the term ledger art, and she, in one of her publications, said, the actual name of the paper is not important. The visual images appearing on that paper are. Ledger art is a convenient descriptive term for an art style. And I would say that as I've indicated, most anthropologists more or less agreed. Um, one of the unintended consequences of all this has been the development of a very strong market for the sale of ledger drawings, uh, both to institutions and uh, to private collectors and as I indicated, people began uh, studying ledger art in earnest by about 1970. And so it was really uh, probably the first uh, kind of Native American art that was uh, accepted into art museums as art. The idea being it's a drawing, it's two dimensional, we know about drawings, this tells a story, you know, we can. Uh, we can view it that way. And one of the um, unfortunate things is along with this market, so this sale at Skinner a couple years ago, I believe, I don't remember the exact, I think 15 drawings went for like $65,000. Um, what has happened, and it's been happening for decades, is that the le early ledgers have often been um, disassembled, and so the images um, are isolated from one another, and then they make their way to an art museum, and they're shown as an individual drawing by an individual artist. So we've lost the original uh, 
integrity of those of those things. All right, now the gist of um, the talk is that I this was not my field, and so my my impulse when I was charged with trying to understand these images was to look at as many other examples as I could of images from the the early Indian Wars period. Um, those are the fewest in number. The later drawings are, are much more uh, numerous. Um, and But I began to look at these early ledgers and early drawings, and originally just to see if I could discriminate stylistic differences. But I, I pretty quickly noticed that these earlier ones were very different from the later ones, and they had a number of things in common. And I now, in the, in the book I recently published, am advocating that these early examples be called war books, both to emphasize the ma material objectness of them um, and to segregate them from what might later be called ledger art. So one of the things that these early examples had in common with the, with the Houghton Ledger is that they are not necessarily on ledgers, but they're on all kinds of Euro-American documents. So this is a drawing from a ledger collected from Sitting Bull in 1870. The drawings uh, represent his experiences as well of, as those of his adopted brother, Jumping Bull. This particular drawing shows Jumping Bull's fight with some crow people. But the salient thing here is it is drawn on a roster sheet from the 31st Infantry uh, from a North Dakota post. And I've noticed that many of them are drawn on military um, documents. They're also drawn on every conceivable kind of document you can imagine. So this is a tool catalog for, uh, for agricultural tools. Um, this is a writing manual. You know, before typewriters, people really practiced their handwriting. And that, by the way, is another Wikishka Society Lance, um, this coming from another Oglala um, community. They're on Bibles, the pages of Bibles. Um, another thing is that about war books is that the drawings, the topic is warfare, and the drawings usually include scenes of battle between native people and non-Indians, that is American civilians, American military, as in this one, as well as intertribal uh, engagement. So here, um, the man I call Artist A on the right um, is fighting, uh, dueling almost, uh, having a gun battle with a crow. The other thing is they're, I believe, all captured. Um, you might note now the label to the right, property of so-and-so. I'm not sure about this particular ledger, uh, but many of these are captured from people that they fought. Oop. Let me go back. Another thing is they're all group records. So uh, in the Houghton ledger that I looked at, there are six major artists, and then there are a few minor artists. That is to say, these men all entered their war narratives into the same book, and that is very typical. In the Indian Wars period, there are no individual artists going around making books. The other thing that I really found striking is that the distribution of these things is very limited. When I began looking at these early ledgers, they come from a very limited geographic region and a very limited cultural region. And that is they're all drawn by Cheyenne and Lakota people um, on the central plains 
And in fact, I think that I, I all, most of the people that were engaged in drawing these books probably knew each other. This practice developed in the 1850s, continued for a couple generations. Um, not everyone knew each other, but many of them did. And that is remarkable because that kind of pictographic representation was very widespread. But the practice of these war books was not. And so all, at some point, all this came together, and I, I felt I understood what was going on. And that is, um, what we're looking at, this uh, hybridity of these ledgers is not material, but it, they mark a social hybridity. Um, so that there's the emergence of a new community of people that are intertribal, and I mentioned before the crisis of authority. Here's the short version of the story and where the dog soldiers and the materiality really come into play. So the Cheyenne people living in Kansas and Nebraska, dog soldiers were one of their war societies, but beginning in the 1830s, this began, they began challenging the traditional leadership and they broke away and formed their own band, a residential band. This was unheard of. They also um, called on their close relatives and friends, the Lakota bands that were down in that country, who they'd actually been associating with for hundreds of years up in the Black Hills before they came down to the Central Plains. And they Essentially, over the next few decades, what you see happening is not only the rise of those war leaders, but you see the development of these entirely new bands um, formed by these young men that want to go to war. And so they're segregating themselves off. They refuse to sign treaties. They want to continue to hunt bison. They're traditionalists, even fundamentalists. Um, they have an ideology of separatism. Uh, they want to stay away from white people if possible, basically be left alone to continue um, their traditional life. And they also develop, you know, of course, very strong feelings about defending their people and defending their lands. And there's uh, a, a native term for these people. Well, one is Lakota Shaihila, and that references this intermarriage between the Cheyennes and Lakotas. It was happening down in this area. Now, this is exactly the area. The problem with Kansas is that it was on the way to Denver. And so you had a lot of wagon trails developing every which way, and that went right through these Cheyenne camps. Um, and so it kicked off this process of hybridization and, and fighting. So what's happening essentially is these war bands are fighting civilians and soldiers, and they're um, taking their documents and they are creating new war societies or setting up parallels to, to, to merge, you know, uh, enhance their merger. And I believe most of these documents were uh, ledgers, that is. They represent these different war societies from this new emerging group, which uh, ultimately, um, I believe, could be called the Northern Nation. So it's these non-traditional people that fight they first waged this war down on the Central Plains where immigration was uh, focused. After the dog soldiers proper and others are defeated down there, they go up into the Yellowstone and Powder River country where the Custer fight happened. Um, but it's all one big, it's a group of people. Um, this is a dog soldier and um, a drawing, this drawing is from the Smithsonian, showing, a, it's cut off on top, but a certain kind of um, 
bonnet and then his rope um, or sash that they would um, tie themselves to the ground with. You know, it's sort of this um, last man standing, do or die, really hardcore uh, warrior ethic. So in other words, dog soldiers started out as being the name of a war society, then a group among the Cheyenne, but it can also be used in a larger sense for this uh, community that I'm discussing. Here we are back with um, artist A from the book. So the other thing is, then here's the materiality. Um, I, I got so interested in why are they wearing these military clothes. Once I identified who these people were, I started looking at the military records of these engagements. And it turns out that there's a set of things that these fighters liked to get from non-Indians that they were fascinated by or that they're trying to get. Um, and likewise, the soldiers are taking certain things from them. They're taking the ledger books from them as evidence of so-called depredations against civilians, for example. But what the only way to really understand what's going on has, uh, is to really look at the epistemology and ontology in Lakota society. So again, they're taking the uniforms of these soldiers to try and appropriate the power that those soldiers have. And this is a practice that had been going on for hundreds of years, and they um, it's very in keeping with the way they waged war on each other, often trying to take power objects from one another. Um, so you see a convergence, especially with things that army regalia and iconography that is resonant of this traditional Lakota uh, ideas about the thunder powers, uh, Wakiya, which are the ones in the West, represented by a thunderbird. So here come these soldiers, and they have this, you know, the national symbol is very similar. And they began to, um, you know, draw those to create a like shape for to draw the the power into. Here's a shield. This particular shield is, was collected by Clark Whistler. And it's, a, it's at American Museum of Natural History from an Oglala Lakota man who fought soldiers and told Whistler he painted this shield after having defeated some soldiers and that it had helped him to kill many more in battle. So the use of this emblem. So there's this, it's, it's, mimesis, it's mimetic, and it's sort of, um, it's how objects are created and given animacy. It's Lakota theories of objects and material. Another example are these military guidons. So the swallowtail shape. Um, I, I don't know if you can see this, but warriors during the Indian War period began carrying banners on their lances in this shape, this one is, is red and black. Um, and the Cheyenne are said to have introduced that. They apparently got the idea from some of the Mexican dragoons that they fought, um, and they brought that idea back up. So why books or why documents? That could be a whole other talk, but uh, there are many threads to this. Um, why they're capturing, why are they interested in um, documents? Well, part of it has to do, of course, with colonial practices. Um, what kinds of documents were they familiar with? Treaties, um, cartography. Let these, these shy kotas had a particular hatred for surveyors and map makers, as you might understand. Um, they understood that there was this conversation going on that they couldn't 
participate in or understand and that it was acting against them in this sort of larger fight for, for the West. This is an example of a letter that was written for a Indian man in 1799 in, in um, French Louisiana. And it's a letter of commendation or recommendation. These things um, were commonly given by military men um, and even traders all the way up till the late 1800s because um, so that their allies could carry these letters and uh, stating that they were dependable or friendly or uh, whatever their virtues were and they could present these to non-Indians that they might meet. There was a real problem with the way the U.S. military waged war um, against Lakota and Cheyenne people because you know, they often attacked villages that were not the fighting people, but they didn't have a way to really tell who was friendly and who wasn't, so they began handing these out a lot to people. The remarkable thing about this particular document is it stayed in, in Indian hands um, until Alice Fletcher collected it, in the early 19th century. It's a native-made um, envelope or casing for it. There are lots of examples in the literature of, that show that native people handled these documents in the same way they handled many of their ritual objects. So I believe, in part, they felt there was an instrumental power in, in, inherent in the document itself. Um, this was kept, the man who owned this, um, it had belonged to his great-great-grandfather. It had been in a medicine bag until the last owner converted and became an Episcopalian. Um, and the missionary on that reservation um, made it known to Alice Fletcher, who was going traveling by, and she collected it. Um, finally... And, I mean, the whole literacy connection um, could be an entire talk, I, but there's also a strategic aspect to the interest in books or documents. So this is a photograph of a, very, a man that was very famous during the Indian War period, Frank Gruard. Um, he became famous as a scout on many, uh, General Crook and others said he was probably the best scout the U.S. military ever employed. And that was because in 1869, he was hired to carry mail between two um, posts in North Dakota. And while he was uh, performing that duty during a snowstorm one winter, he got jumped by a group of Lakotas that included Sitting Bull, and they took him captive. He ended up living in uh, those camps for a number of years, so he learned to speak Lakota. Well, one of the things that Sitting Bull had him do was uh, read um, mail that was being conveyed between military posts so that he could know what the military was planning. And I found statements from um, warriors in the late 19th century that said Crazy Horse did the same thing. And of course, Sitting Bull had a whole campaign. He had people sort of in the field up in North Dakota intercepting, um, intercepting couriers between forts. So um, I want to read one more quote. I, I feel like I'm running a little long and I've skipped several quotes that I would have liked to have used, but I want to read it, a quote. Um, and this is the statement uh, in North Dakota again. Um, as I mentioned, f a Sitting Bull had people out to try and intercept these mail couriers and they were often killed, but not always. And one man that was captured and then let go um, later gave a statement to the commander at Fort Buford. 
and he said that the men that caught him told him that they intended to intercept all mail carriers and kill all Americans. And he was berated with to stop carrying the papers of the whites and consider yourself lucky that your life was spared, but don't come back again or you'll be treated like an American. Do you not know what you're doing? It's not our life you are working for, it's our death, the destruction of the redskins, of our warriors, of our women, of our children. Wherever the white people establish themselves, the buffalo go, and when the buffalo are gone, the red hunters of the prairies must die of hunger. The whites, the white men are the cause of all this. If they had not come here, we should all have enough to eat. We shall be able to live on our lands only when they have gone from them. Um, and there are lots of uh, statements in the literature about, uh, written by non-Indians about the very um, fact of being seen writing or reading arousing suspicion in Native communities. Um, and that went on for, that, that sort of went on throughout the col the colonial period, uh, distrustful of what they're doing, thinking it has something to do with taking advantage of them, and so forth. So I'm going to close with just a summary, I guess, of I think what I don't think we'll ever know really what the meaning of these ledger books or drawings was because cultures have changed so much since that time. I think to understand the drawings, you really would have to have a good command of the language because a lot of the images um, include, I think, allusions um, that only sort of an insider could know. That they're not standalone things. And in terms of the materiality, animacy of objects uh, for Lakota people, um, I don't think a l all that is still there, but anthropologists working in other places like the Amazon um, among groups that maybe have more traditional culture are now see this as um, a topic, you know, to record different cultures' concepts of materiality. But at any rate, I think that what art historians have been missing is the native understanding of these things, which we can only glean a little bit of, but it's clear to me that they were valued as objects um, and not just as a collection of images or images. And it is, um, so the question becomes, you know, ironically, the art historians that study ledger art, many of them set out to correct the mistakes of anthropology, um, which was seen to be sort of, had many faults, of course, but um, they thought that by discussing these things as art, that they might be less ethnocentric, but I think in some ways they're equal, if not more so, when you think of things like group records being torn up and you know the whole emphasis on the individual artist, the named artist. Well, the, the issue I have is that it always defaults to us. So I think that sort of the discussion about multiculturalism and appreciating other arts is in some ways quite superficial because we never seem to be able to fully engage that or create a space for that. It, it just becomes transformed into our version of things. And maybe that's necessary. I think one of the strong forces behind the interest in the uh, looking at native material as art now is because it's a powerful post-colonial uh, form of reconciliation maybe. I mean, if we can agree that we're all artists. That gives a place to start from and go forward from there, not recapitulating the past. Um, but there are a lot of uh, issues and questions, and I'd like to hear what you and the audience have uh, feel about these issues and think. So I'll end my um, 
my comments there. Thanks very much. We have a few minutes. I'd like to open the floor to comments and comments and questions. Um, Professor Paula Rubel. <laughs> No, I, I feel like... Uh, the problem sometimes is that the aesthetic that they're using is a Western aesthetic. Mm -hmm. When they're not familiar with what the meanings of this are, uh, consist of the fact that they don't know the language, they don't know the culture. I mean, I think a greater appreciation of these artifacts is art is present when you have that background, when you have the understanding of what these objects mean in the culture, then I think you can more, you know, appreciate the material more than merely looking at it as art, because I think most of the time they're examining it as art. And as I told Castle this morning, some uh, dealer is selling 70 separate pictures. I mean, he's treating the pictures as art, but I think they're just being examined in terms of an aesthetic appreciation on the part of someone who's going to buy them. The other question I have is kind of a, a strange one. These people originally did not have the horse. And they didn't get the horse until the late uh, 16th, 17th century. And I kept on thinking as you talked about the war complex and the meetings, what it might have looked at, <coughs> at the time without the horse. I mean, the horse becomes a very central part of the warfare complex. and I'm. I mean, it's something that you can't uh, obviously not retrieve at all because it's, you know, there are no early records that would give us that kind of information. But I wonder if it was as strong and as important as it became with the horse because the horse gave people a mobility that they didn't have before. Right. That's <laughs> and, and, it's, and it goes back to instrumental power. Um, um, horses became so important. Um, and, but to go back to the first point, I, about how things are shown as art, I think there's a great deal of variation between institutions, curators, on that regard. So, um, the Nelson Atkins Museum and Gaylord Torrance, the curator, who's sitting to my left and is a very good friend of mine that I've learned a tremendous amount from is incredibly sensitive to and experienced with Native culture. And that's very important to him. It is, and I remember, uh, I used to teach, as you know, the, the ethnicity of Native Americans. And it wasn't until the 80s, or even in the middle 80s, that people from the Department of Art History used to come in and take my course in order to have some context within which to place the objects. And yeah. that, that comes later. I'm not sure, you know, I've not having talked for a long time whether that's still present or not. Well, I think they do make an effort to engage with those sources, but their understanding is fairly superficial. And furthermore, I think many of them would make the argument that there's no right interpretation, there's no one way to look at these uh, books or these images um, that contemporary perspectives are as valid as those from the 19th century? It's, it's a question. I mean, it's, it's a, these issues have been debated for many years, and we're not going to have an answer tonight. But uh, just following on uh, the comment about variability, there are some advocates of the art um, paradigm that are radically um, antagonistic towards anthropology, towards culture and history. The Peabody Essex Museum for a while would not sell any books that referred to culture or history about Native American material because they were wanting to take the extreme. They just wanted to exercise that. Oh, oh boy, so. Sorry, can we, can we get the lights on so ask the senior questioners? Thank you. Leslie? 
Um, I'm, you know, I keep thinking about um, all these drawings that are being done specifically on books, and I'm wondering if, um, I mean, I, I understand the argument about appropriation, but is it of power, but is it also possible that, or maybe they're just drawing all these books because it's what's convenient, but um, is it possible that these drawings are defacements of these objects? Because I'm thinking, for instance, of in other contexts, you know, not planes, but there's this episode in, I think it's in Massachusetts, with the Puritan who's murdered and then Bibles are shoved into his abdominal cavity to sort of like take that, you know, sort of like literally shove it, buddy. And then, um, and then with Seb Fowles' work down in, because Seb's in our department at Barnard, um, who's been looking at this, um, this rock art down in the um, Taos Gorge where Comanche have drawn images on top of Pueblo images where it looks as though mm -hmm. they may be defacing them. And so I'm wondering, as a, a form of power, right? Right, right. And I'm wondering if that might be happening here, so that anything that is of book form that's captured in the process of war is then something that one draws upon um, as a way to to use it, to appropriate it, but also to deface it. Well, I think that is happening. I would probably put it in a little different. Uh, terms, I think that the uh, when they draw over writing, you know, there it, there could well be an aspect of sort of, you know, counting coup and. Okay. But also, there are some ledgers where you can see that um, the native person has tried to mimic the handwriting, mm -hmm. and so they're also perhaps tapping into it. I think it has many dimensions. I think, okay. you know, they recognize it as in sort of the technology of power part. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's about the document. It's also about the writing. Uh, I think that their historical experience <coughs> with missionaries um, was probably pretty critical to that um, because you know, the missionaries would say this is the word of God, there are words in here of God. Yeah. And I think there was a correspondence with some of the indigenous theories of uh, animacy of certain objects. And, and so there's, it's a complex, okay. yeah, it's a complex bill. I'm just going to pop in because I, I, I know of a couple of objects, uh, medicine objects, that actually have as part of them uh, crucifixes and rosary beads wrapped around them. Mm -hmm. So I think it exactly is this kind of thing. It's, you know, it's taking that whatever that thing of power is from that other that really foreign culture and you know tying it into your power. Right. So it's alterity. Um, you might. Uh, one thing I didn't get into is that actually these ledgers became very contested in the frontier, so that probably enhanced their value. I mean, the military, so the native, the warriors would take them from people they fought. The military would then try to take them back when they raided their village. And I mean, there are some examples of double capture things, you know, um, almost everything that survives from Custer soldiers uh, was actually recovered from uh, Indian camps. Uh -huh. The things, you know, they were the things that they took. And, you know, it's garments, it's books, it's watches, photographs, you know, there's certain kinds of things that if you look at the military records as I did, of the accounts of these battles and so forth, you can see that there's a category of things that they're going, that they're so interested in over and over. But I'm... Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you. This, this is, I think you're spot on, your critique. And speaking as a museum anthropologist who works in a different part of the world, also interested in empowered things, I want to pose you a professional <coughs> question. Because um, you started in the Anthropology Museum and the tension between the old creaky Anthropology Museum 
and the art museum the cave around me kind of move. And all right, to go back to the kind of analysis you've given us, the animism, the power of things, and I haven't seen your resuscitated halls yet, I want to, but how does one begin to try to convey this kind of thing in a you know, three-dimensional exhibit in the context of a museum? Well, yes, that was, I've only done it once, and that's the exhibit with Butch, and as I said, um, for one thing, you know, a lot of talk about what are the fundamentals that are going to guide everything, and um, I think that as a museum goer myself, I'm not a big fan of reading text, and I don't think that reading is a, is a different thing than an exhibit. So I, I hope you'll have a chance to come to the Peabody, but what we basically tried to do was create conversations between different kinds of things and different media in a way that would activate or animate the drawings and the objects in relation to each other. It's a relational field and we used, for example, a soundtrack of a thunderstorm that builds and then recedes. Um, video of, of waving grass that grows in intensity. Um, on one wall, we installed arrows as if they're flying through the air. Um, just we used video in many different ways. Originally, we had a scent machine that was emanating the scent of sage and or cedar because thunderbirds live in a cedar tree. Um, but that company went out of business and we haven't been able to replace it. Um, but we want people to somehow feel more of a gestalt, uh, something uh, in a, from seeing these different objects together to, to experience things. Um, yes? Uh, could you tell us some more about the spirituality of war? and? Uh whether that is something we understand today, we're always wrapped up in wars, was it something different for the, uh, the Plains people? Well, one thing about that is, I mean, there are many ways to answer that, but, you know, one thing, just to go back again to the turn to art, I mean, I think that one of the factors in that is that a disinclination to look at warfare um, from the past. You know, there's a feeling in some quarters that even referring to Plains Indians in the 19th century as warriors is somehow a pejorative now. So, um, Yes, humans are often at war. The specific things, and this is, we try and convey this in the exhibit, you know, a part of that is, of course, that young men underwent training with holy men in addition to, of course, riding horses and practicing with weapons and being extremely physically fit. The, you know, they ha came under the tutorage of a holy man that culminated in the the you know vision quest um, experience that hopefully uh, during which they their particular spirit helper in the world would reveal itself and that they could then go forward with that. Um, there's lots more about you know this the rituals of war. And Lakota people still do things both before battles and after battles. Um, but I think that's all I want to say about about that. Um, but the important part for for this was, you know, the inscriptive practices and and just the emphasis on the power of of the manifestations of their helpers, their supernatural. Helpers. Supernatural 
wrap okay. up soon, but I'd like to use the chair's prerogative to ask one final question to go back to something you mentioned at the beginning, which is um, given we've been talking a lot about the ontological status of these as objects, their reclassification, their continual reclassifications from the moment they were first appropriated um, and transformed. And so what I'd like to hear is the end of the story about the Nagpur request in that um, what is their current reclassification under federal policy, which they have to slot into yet another category of understanding, not, not art, not artifact, not power object, but something yet again. And so I wonder what, what if. Yes, that's a great question. Um, and I, one of the answers, Aaron, so the status is pending. One of the problems is trying to figure out, you know, the identity of the person that it might have been interred with. How could we know? There are many bands of Lakota at the Little Bighorn fight. Um, but I think for me, the overall project, the most significant thing I learned from engaging with this material was um, the foregrounding of this community of Lakota Cheyenne people that, be, that develop their own identity and so that is a wrinkle in this because I think that when the Little Bighorn battle was fought, that was probably the most important identity to them. Um, and so there's a tendency that's reinforced by administrative things like the Bureau of Indian Affairs, blood quantum, and tribal membership, and, and so forth, <coughs> to think in terms of tribes and you know they're bounded and and today that's really reinforced with you know attached to land bases and so forth but uh, that's really not the way that it was that it's been reified into that so at any rate it's just difficult um, to determine and there was a lot of that intermarriage but I it's pending, but my thought at this point, uh, after finishing all the research, is that if I had to make a guess of which Lakota band this particular document came from and belonged with, it's probably Minikoju, um, not Hunkapapa, not Oglala, but there's really no way to to, to say, so I'm not sure what's going to happen. Well, what's going to happen now is we're going to open the store, and um, you're welcome to stay and have a glass of wine and um, ask Dr. McLaughlin some more questions informally. And uh, thank you all for coming, and join me in thanking her once again.